Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 356, recorded Friday, July 20th, 2018. Adam Fisher and Valley of Genius. Triangulation is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience, then invites them to apply to your job. They find great candidates for you, so try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans, introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, a show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology. We spend an hour together. This is going to be a lot of fun. You've already started to see excerpts from this in Wired and Vanity Fair. I know a lot of you are very excited about a book that's about to come out. I guess it's out now. I seem to have a copy in my hand. It's called Valley of Genius, the Uncensored History of Silicon Valley as Told by the Hackers, Founders, and Freaks Who Made It Go Hello World. <laughs> who Made It Go Boom. <laughs> Adam Fisher, its author, is here. Adam, it's great to meet you finally. Uh, I feel like, you know, when I read the the beginning that you and I kind of were lived parallel worlds. I'm a little older than you, but the same thing, the Atari, and you start typing in programs from Compute Magazine. And yeah. if you live in Silicon Valley, there was something in the air back then. You know, I thought I had a boring suburban uh, <laughs> childhood. I couldn't wait to get out to the big Little city, did you, know. you know, be a writer in New York. And and uh, it turns out the most interesting thing about me and, and that I ever did was grow up in Silicon yeah. Valley and really drink that Kool-Aid. I mean, I was, you know, I went to computer camp in 82, was the geekiest kid there. I had uh, the, the entire archive of TAP. A magazine, uh -huh. Technological American Party. It was basically the. I don't know that actually. That Tap. The, the, okay, so. What does that come? Some commie conspiracy? It, yes. <laughs> it's it, the manifesto for the. So you know what the phone freakers were? Yeah. So the yippies really picked up on this, and they had their uh, kind of technological uh -huh. wing. And the yippies were the Occupy of the. Uh, they late were the 70s. Occupy yeah. exactly. They yeah. were they were the extreme Abby Rubin and, left yeah. with it. Abby. Yeah. Be Hoffman, Hoffman. Uh, and Jerry Rubin and Jerry, Jimmy Rubin. I, this is before my it's time. So yeah. long ago now, <laughs> the names. So yeah, so they were like the first twenty six hundred magazine. They uh, yeah. is how to make the blue box, the black box, all the other color. Well, that boxes. was tap. Oh. That was tap. But they also were like, oh, you know, it was all about you know f the man, right? right. So it was all, all like. Here you could take your water uh, meter out and put it in backwards. Oh! Your, your water bill would go down <laughs> every time you flush the toilet. So like <laughs> that was that was the kind of stuff so that you was were, just in the air. You there was a, and I always felt this was the best part of Silicon. There was a subversive streak to all Everything of this. Everything was subversive. Yeah. yeah. It became the they became the man. Now they're the man. They're but, the man. But in the early days, it was subversive. It was like let's let's uh, let's change everything let's it w so anyway we're, we're, we're i'm getting ahead of myself because we should talk about the, the 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 story about the book so when did you get the, the idea to do this you were writing about tech for a long time before this yeah so. you know i was an editor at wired so i was churning out uh tech features um and in 2008 i decided to go freelance finally be a writer and you know i was doing tech features but i also was doing like travel and art and just anything that kind of were you of burned out a little on technology maybe no no i've I just, seen that happen to people where they go ah, i'm done with this no it just especially seemed, in 2008 2008 well you know when someone says you want to go you know i was getting free vacation yeah travel's good travel writing is Nothing a good gig wrong with okay? it. Yeah, like that's yeah. a good gig so i was not saying no to that okay and then my daughter was born, and ah. I thought, oh, I got to get serious. I got to get serious. And I was like, I need to actually 
uh, write about something that matters. Yeah. Well, what matters most? What is the biggest story of our time? What right. is my daughter? What is this world that my daughter is being born into? What does she need to know? Yeah. And that's why I decided to do the, the history of the modern Silicon Valley. I also feel like it's slipping away from us a little bit. A bunch of guys that I interviewed when I started interview. I started this four, almost five years ago, and I started interviewing people who were there at the beginning at Xerox Park, et cetera. Doug Engelbart Doug passed Engelbart. away. Doug um, Engelbart. Yeah, and you know Bob Taylor passed Bob Taylor. away. Yeah, we're starting to lose him. Yeah, yeah, and we're starting to lose these early guys. So I got these. I think I got Bob Taylor's last interview. So he was the thank you head of Park. Thank you for getting um, these. And he was great, you know. There, there have been other histories of Silicon Valley written. This is not really a history of Silicon Valley per se. This is more like, um, I don't know how to describe it. Tell me, the, tell me. Yeah, it may what, help if people understand how you wrote this. Let's talk about that, but what, name a history of Silicon Valley. Oh, there's quite a few of them. Fire in the Valley. 1984 yes, that old. came out, my friend. Yeah, 1984. Know. Yeah. There's nothing modern, I there's guess. There's nothing modern. There's dogfight. There's some more modern dog, stuff. Dog but it's not a history it, of the... Of there the isn't it's not a, a continuous there history. There isn't a history. No. Dogfight is a great book. But it's modern. It's what's but going on with Amazon yeah, a, now, right? Yeah, I mean, you can you can get, like, the Amazon story from Brad Stone. Right. Dogfight from Vol Vogelstein. Right. You can get... You can get uh, you know, the Facebook story. Levy's Google book. Right. And you can line them all up. Right. And you can read all of them. Right. But if you just want to read one book and get kind no, of like the right. big There's picture nothing. of the 40, yeah, what, it's either Hackers, Levy's book. Levy's book's brilliant, is, but that stops in like is, 1978 or something. Yeah, it, it is ha half of it's at Harvard or, or yeah, MIT. MIT yeah. and, then, and then, or you could do Fire in the Valley, yeah. which ends in 84. Yeah. And I've got the third edition. It's smaller than the second edition. Okay? <laughs> Less he, has happened. He keeps taking stuff out. Okay? It's not it's not the history. But so, this is an oral history and that's so what I love about this. It's a different it's a different kind of history. Um it's an oral history which means it's not Adam Fisher's history. Your voice is not in this at all. I'm not in there. Yeah. You know? It's 185,000 words, 500 pages. <sighs> so let's say uh, 10,000 sentences, right? You know, we'll say, line them up in order. That's your book. But every one of those sentences, I had to get some billionaire to say for right. me because I wanted their yeah. voices. Did you go in though knowing, okay, I want to tell this story or did you l just let them talk? And then it what, what you talk about is scissors and paste True tape, yeah. <laughs> and you, you paste it together. So the it's hard to describe this. If somebody picks up the book, they'll immediately see, though, when you're reading about uh, Facebook, it's a bunch of different voices, one after the other, but they're not all in the same room, I presume. This no. Was, these were separate interviews. So, yeah, it's it, it it's exactly like making a documentary movie. Right. Each chapter is like a documentary movie. Right. So what would you do if you were making a documentary about Facebook or any other uh a company and I want to, you know, try to capture the early days. You go round up all the people who were there. You you ask all of them to tell you your their story, okay? And then and then you cut it together. Right. So it's as if they're all um, at a bar. That's what it about felt it. like to me. A really yeah. great cocktail party. Yeah. Where if you got all the people who were involved in general magic, let's say, and you got them all and you sat them down, they'd be going back and forth swapping these stories. That's right. But you interview them separately. Yes. <laughs> transcribed it, and then literally with scissors. So look, I, you know, I love computers. <laughs> I I love computers. I can't write without a computer. I'm a computer geek. But there, but to do this, you've got to take. Um, so there's about maybe 10 voices, a dozen voices in each chapter because that's about the right yeah. number of people you yeah. want talking yeah. in your little documentary movie, right? And then and then you got to look at them all at the same time to try to get to try to create an arc out of all these quotes. And there is not a screen big enough to to have everything open at once. I literally resorted was resort, resorted to printing them all out and having like across the, the living room 
like lines of paper all taped together so you could see the entire like you know 10 feet of interview and then and then there would be like five 10 feet of interviews and then i'd Put on my kneecaps from from the <laughs> Knee garage. Pads. Yeah, literally for like when I'm working on the house. And like crawl around and be like, that quote should be first. And then that quote. That's and that how, by the and way, then, we used to do this. And then cut them. But the, the theory was you would never have to do that again. Yeah, but and I, and I desperately. But then what do you do with the cut together thing? You scan it? No, then I. You then have to I, type it then in? I, then I have it, right? Yeah. And so then I can actually cut and oh, paste. Oh, then you can do it. Then I cut and paste. Oh, good, all right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but to get that first rough cut, um, I, it works. Uh, yeah, it really feels like. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if you could sit down? Uh, well, see, so, so for me, the ones that resonate are the early chapters because these are all people. This was me growing up: yeah. Stephen Levy, Kevin Kelly, yeah. Fred Davis, Fabrice Florin, and then the whole Earth Electronic Link, Larry Brilliant, Stuart Brand, Ram Das. You interviewed Ram Das. Ah, uh, okay. So you know. Some people you can't get to. Yeah. Steve Jobs would be a tough interview yeah. right now. But you there's know lots. What I mean? But he's got a lot of. But there's archival, archival stuff. stuff. You yeah. can go to Stanford. You can go to the his, uh, History Museum. You know, you can you can uh, go to reporters who interviewed these guys and say, "Hey, you know, I'm doing this thing. Can I have your master tapes?" And you can get sometimes quotes that have never been seen before. And sometimes they're just the classic but, quotes. But then they're suddenly in context now yeah. because you've got the other people around it. And, and it, it, it's, it's a really interesting way to write a book. I, the only other person I could think of is Studs Terkel. Except Studs didn't cut them together. Right. Working, they're not cut together. Every chapter is a different, different person. person. And it's just But it has interview. that feel of immediacy and right. you're hearing the person talk in their words right. about what happened. And I right. really, that's what made Studs I, brilliant. I love, I love yeah. that book yeah. working, but so it's like, we did it a little differently. Yeah, it's like, uh, like a cocktail party meets working or, <laughs> so, or something. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking. A drunk working. <laughs> uh, you've been getting some great excerpts, which is really nice. I just saw one in Wired just came out, and I think you had one in Vanity Fair earlier. Vanity Fair, Wired, Medium, the Smithsonian Magazine. Oh, nice. And New York Magazine will do the General Magic chapter. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. General, we're going to talk in a couple of weeks with a couple of filmmakers who just made a documentary about uh, General Magic. And they, they quote uh, um, John Scully saying, it's the most important company in Silicon Valley nobody ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. But it's in here. You got a whole chapter. And I, you'd be I, amazed I, at the people who worked at, at uh, General Magic. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, General Magic is going to have a premiere at the Computer History Museum in a couple of weeks. And I will be on stage interviewing uh, the magicians, as they call them, afterwards and trying oh, to... Oh, that'll be fun. Andy Hertzfeld. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to finally get. It's it's uh, too bad our good, our good friend Bill Atkinson was going through a, a, yeah. you know, kind of a personal crisis. His wife was very ill and wasn't available for this book or for that documentary. But he is coming to the movie oh, opening. I've been told. I, I talked to the filmmakers earlier. We'll have that their interview August third on Triangulation. And it so it's kind of we did the interview earlier today. It's kind of been uh, Internet History Day for me, which is which is. Really fun. I'm very jealous because you got, I've interviewed many of the people in here, but you got some people I've always wanted to interview. You've got Zuckerberg in here. Did you, were you able to interview well, him? Well, Zuck said no, but guess what? He used to talk a lot to the Harvard Crimson <laughs> when he was 18 years old. He talked way too and much. And you wouldn't believe what he said. And yeah. I harvested all those quotes and, and nice. properly attributed them in nice. the back. And Ev it's Williams. super fun. Ev, uh, I got a, a lot from Ev. He's yeah. super interesting. Peter Thiel. Uh, wow. I mean, this is, uh, and the, and by the way, the pictures, you said that this picture, uh, there's pictures of, of all of these guys. Here's Stuart Brand, Jaron Lanier, who pretty much, uh, invented virtual reality years, a decade, more than a decade ago, almost 20 years ago now. Um, Sean Parker, Mark Zuckerberg, there's uh, Ev, but you said this picture of Alvy Ray Smith, who was the founder of Pixar, um, he never saw that before. He had never seen it before. It's a great and, picture. And there there he is in front of the stills from... Um, is that Toy Story? Toy Story. And then you see that lamp. <laughs> the Luxo lamp that we, is their trademark that, to this day. That is the lamp. That is the actual That's the lamp Luxo. <laughs> that, that John Lasseter was like looking at when he's like, God, I got to make a little trailer wow. here. And then some people 
not so well known. You got some people I would never have thought of. For instance, this guy. Who's Howard Warshaw? Howard Warshaw is very important to the Atari story, which I think, is, you know, Atari is just. Um, I don't think you can overstate its importance, yeah. and we can talk about why. Okay. Um, uh, but Atari was a company that, at its peak, made more money, uh, grossed more money than all of Hollywood combined. Wow. 18 months later, <laughs> no Atari. <laughs> It's okay, a, and it's the quintessential they, uh, Silicon Valley story. You think this boom and bust thing is new? Uh, it <laughs> oh, is no. not. Okay, and um, they blamed it on that guy. It's his fault. It's his fault. It isn't his fault. It isn't really at all. But Howard Warshaw was the guy. He kind of was the fall guy. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he was. Uh, they blamed it all on this poor hippie he programmer. Wrote what might be the worst computer game of all time, video game of all time. But it wasn't his fault. They made him do it in six weeks. Yeah. So <laughs> come on, guys. Uh, E.T. You. Yeah. This is the one that Atari had to bulldoze right in Alamogordo. Exactly that famous story. <laughs> we got we got the inside scoop on that in the book. It's oh, it's for me. See, I know there are a lot of people, there are people my age watching, but there are also yet a lot of younger people watching who have no idea. No idea yeah. And I, to me, this resonates incredibly. I, yeah, I'm laughing, I'm crying. It brings the whole era, the amazing era, back to me. And I, and, and by the way, that era almost right up to the present because you talk about Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. But I, I hope this resonates with the people who weren't there because this was an amazing time. Well, what's interesting about it is Silicon Valley was built by children, okay? <laughs> Some of the, the, the most famous companies, the, the most important companies, almost two or one, were, were built by uh, uh, young people. Very okay? young. Okay, very yeah. young people. The, uh, uh, you know, a... <laughs> Apple, founder not old enough to drink, okay? <laughs> Napster, founder not old enough to drink. Um, uh, Facebook, founder not old, old enough to drink. And then, and then like the, you know, the mature kind of companies, you know, we're talking about uh, Atari, uh, Activision, um, uh going to skip the middle thing, but eBay, and Google, like all founders in their 20s when yeah. they founded it. The, yeah. And they were, and they were, uh, and they ran their companies like kids would run companies. And it was uh, tons of fun, tons of fun. Everybody uh, remembers it fondly. Uh, but it's also, that, it will raise some eyebrows yeah. in this day and age. Well, and I, I think you were starting to say this before the show began. These are the stories that these people tell each other or right. they're over a drink. And you remember when? Yeah. And it's the stuff you actually don't really see all the time in the in the official histories. Exactly. I did the last thing I wanted to do was write an academic history because I Boring, right? right. I, I wanted to hear what these guys remembered and what they thought was important. Um, so yeah, it's 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 their best kind of war stories. The the stories that really you kind of have to know to to be an insider because they're always referenced to. Right. You know, I, I know people on the show uh, who watch the show probably know who Doug Engelbart is, right. but I guarantee you, no one else does. But uh, outside of Silicon Valley, right. he's a total unknown. He's a god in Silicon but Valley, but he's a god because he did the demo. Of the mother of all demos. 68, which, yeah. the first chapter, yeah. The Big Bang, it's yeah. called. Yeah, he showed the mouse windowing. 1968, uh, menus, he invented it all. He, he had Skype running on that thing in 68. <laughs> yeah. They had a video. That's right, I remember. They of the did. other engineers in the other room. That's right. And guess who was there at that demo? Who? Stuart Brand, uh -huh. the man who uh, most responsible for getting uh, acid out of kind of the labs <laughs> and into the mouths and minds of hippies. Wait, wait. Now that I did not know. We're going to take a break yes. and find out more about that. L there is a threat of LSD. Not in, even now it's coming back. I guess people are microdosing. Microdosing things is everywhere. Bizarre, 
But there is, even Steve Jobs said, I don't trust you if you haven't taken acid. That's right. Uh, there was there was a very big counterculture element to this. And we're going to talk about that and more. Uh, Adam Fisher is my guest. Valley of Genius, the uncensored history of Silicon Valley, a book we very, yeah, let's all, book we it's very fine. much needed. And, you know, I, I said or, that maybe the younger generation wouldn't, this wouldn't resonate with them, but it clearly is because because of all these excerpts. And I'm hearing from people in the chat room saying, you got to get this guy on. And I said, well, Adam's coming. Don't worry. Right. He's coming. Don't worry. Yeah, you um, guys are my audience. I, I wrote it oh, for your audience. They're excited about this, let me tell you. They really are. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, I want to make your life a lot easier. We just use ZipRecruiter. With amazing results, it was really interesting. I was actually sitting next to Lisa when she said, "All right, we need to hire a, a full charge bookkeeper, um, and we need her right now because <laughs> because our, our our current gal is taking a new job and she wants to leave right away." What am I going to do? I said, "Well, you, you're zip recruiter." So she posts it, and literally, I mean, we're at, this is at breakfast. She said, "Oh, I've got a lead. Oh, I've oh these oh I got another oh these are good." ZipRecruiter really works. It starts by posting your listing to more than 100 job sites. You know, you know. I mean, I think you know. Somebody great's out there. The question is, how do I get that person? How do I reach them? Where are they? What job board are they on? What are they reading? So you eliminate that immediately by posting on every job board practically, plus the social networks like Twitter and Facebook. So your job listing is out there. But then ZipRecruiter goes to the next level because they start finding people who, who have the right experience who are right for you, and they reach out and they say, oh, you got to apply to this job. This has revolutionized how you find your next hire. 80% of the employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in as little as one day. And I will tell you, it was, it was, an, it was less than an hour, and we had five really good candidates. She's, she's just jumping up and down. She thought this was going to be hard. Because, you know, it always happens. That person leaves at the worst possible time. you got that job to fill. You're already shorthanded. Uh, the person in, in charge of doing this, especially if you're a small business like ours, has other things to do. ZipRecruiter makes it easy. You post it. All the uh, applications, all the resumes go into their interface. They format them so it's easy. You have screening questions, everything you need, and then they push the right people towards you. It couldn't be easier. It couldn't work faster. This is it. And right now, you can do it for free. For free, if you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire, and I will vouch for it. It really worked. ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. Yes, we filled that job. Please don't send your applications. <laughs> we filled it quickly. Uh, we're talking with Adam Fisher, Valley of Genius, the Uncensored History of Silicon Valley. You mentioned Stuart Brand. He's best known for the Whole Earth Catalog. And, of course, uh, Steve Jobs very famously in that uh, grad commencement speech said, stay hungry, stay foolish. He was quoting the, the motto of the Whole Earth Catalog. It was really influential. You talked to Stuart for this book? Yes. I'm so jealous. Yeah, I don't. I didn't know how lucky I was, but he. Did you know who he was when you were? I mean, when you sat down with him, did you get an yeah, idea? Yeah, yeah. But I didn't know how hard it was to get an interview yeah, with we've been him. Trying for years. When I sat down with him. <laughs> um, so yeah, Stuart Brand. I didn't know. Tell, wait, okay, I thought it was Timothy Leary, who was a professor at Harvard. Uh, his colleague, Richard Alpert, Ram Das, who basically took LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, out of the psychology labs where they were using it. It was legal to, to test it on people and started using it recreationally. But you say Stuart Brand was involved? Well, yeah, but this was a Harvard elite, okay? Yes, right. It was a Harvard you elite that habit. was doing it, yeah, okay? Yeah. And there was a similar thing happening at Stanford with a Stanford uh, elite. But... The great unwashed at that time were dropping out of not college but high school, and they were the hippies. Okay, this is in the in the sixties. We're talking about the sixties. I I'm not old enough to remember it. I okay, am. so you can correct me when I'm <laughs> I wrong. Will, I do. Okay. So it was I don't, actually I can't because anybody who lives through the sixties doesn't really remember <laughs> anything. So it was Stuart. <laughs> Stuart, who was throwing these trips festivals, ah, right? Yeah, he was. Uh, he was like the kind of organized um, guy in Down the Mary, Longshoreman's Hall in, in San the Francisco. Mary Pranksters, yeah, right? right? 
Um, and it was actually John Markoff who turned me on to the fact that it was Stuart Brand that really did the work of getting getting the LSD on the streets. I did not know that. And Markoff, so, of course, New York Times, former New York Times reporter. He's retired now, but he's kind of devoted himself to computer history, which I'm very happy to hear he's doing that. And uh, he uh, I, and I were both on Stuart's Whole Earth Electronic Link, The Well, way back in the day. Uh, another so, chapter. Yeah. Yeah, a great chapter, by the way. Really enjoyed. So okay, so Stuart so Stuart Brand the was there at the Engelbart um, uh, demo. He was at the demo. He was he was the film filmographer of the demo. You see the films. That's it was, him. Stuart was behind oh, the no camera. Idea. Okay, Stuart Brand was the first guy who put the phrase "personal computer" into print. Wow. Uh, he, now he wow. heard it from Alan Kay, so um, he didn't make it up. Um, Alan Kay made up everything first. He did. He's he's <laughs> he's, he's a genius. He's the guy. He's the guy. <laughs> okay. If you like anything that's happened today, ask Alan Kay why. <laughs> exactly. And there's some amazing Alan oh, Kay quotes. Did in you there. interview him too? Yeah. I'm did, so jealous. There's a quote. Why don't you look at the quote that um, is in the middle there? So I'll tell. So Stuart oh, Brand. Funny. Fast forward from '68. It's '84. Um, Stephen Levy puts out this book, Hackers. Stephen Levy is reviewing computer games for the whole Earth Catalog magazine. Um, Brand reads Hackers, says, this is a great book. Let's have a conference, the first Hackers conference. And then the next year he says, this is great. Let's invite all these people wow. onto the well. Yeah. So the well was made out of hackers from the hackers conference and Deadheads. and Stu and Stewart's kind of intellectual <laughs> friends and but the real money maker was the deadheads the because dead they heads. need something to do David between Gans and his crew man. well yeah because they needed something to do between shows right. they had they couldn't send each, they couldn't no, they, they couldn't communicate and everything so yeah, the they, deadheads really yeah. made the well and the well really mushed all these different subcultures together into one culture. So the well was a bulletin board system. Yes. Uh, Thank you. And you'd, you, it was very primitive. I mean, it was so it, it looked like you were on a teletype. It was just text, text, text. But it was a social network. It was the, it was one of the first. The Absolutely. First, yeah. And a culturally uh, important one, I think. Hugely yeah. important. It was my first experience of the internet because the other thing about the well, you could drop out of the well interface and be on the internet. And use Gopher and Archie. <laughs> and I remember, I'll never forget doing that the first time and thinking, there's a lot of people out there. And this was when there were probably a thousand people using yeah. it. Yeah. But it, it was very important to all of us. Yeah, this. And, and that's kind of where Stuart Brand kind of inculcated his values. You know, he was the guy who said information wants to be free yes. first yes. at the hackers conference the hacker and ethic he, the hacker exit and and these this kind of this was like a, a bubbling soup and he was stirring the pot and creating this kind of new post hippie <sighs> culture which they <laughs> at that time they kind of called the techno culture and then then Mondo and then Wired kind of picked it up. But now it's everywhere. Now he, it is the popular He culture. gave Mondo 2000 their first computer? Is that no, Dan said? Kotke. Dan Kotke. Now let's talk about Dan because I love Dan. He's a sweetheart. He was the guy people will remember from the Steve Jobs movie who didn't get stock when everybody else did when Apple went public. And he sat in Steve Jobs' waiting room, finally got to see Steve, said, Steve, I, I, I was like your third employee. Steve said, yeah, but you're not an engineer. You get no stock. Exactly. And he's one of the sweetest guys you've ever... We've interviewed him also on this show. He's kind of like Waz, like one of these incredible, legendary sweethearts. sweethearts. But he's, he, he is now an engineer. There's a little sadness in, uh, to me when I speak to Dan. Yeah. I think he knows... You know, he was at Reed with Steve. Yes. Uh, he was Steve's best friend best at friend. Reed. Yep. Steve paid for his plane ticket to go to India with him. Oh, when you talk about India. India when too, when yeah. they when they go look for the guru. Yeah. They were looking for Ram Das's guru. Right. And they had the book, Ram Das. And yep. they went Be to here Kanishi. Now. Yeah. Yep. They they went to the, the ashram where it was all happening just a year before and that guru had died. Um uh, so they found another guru and Steve, <laughs> you know, got his head shaved by the guru and he came back to Atari where he had a job as like a soldering tech. 
Um, again, this guy's 20, 19. He's, he's a this kid. guy's 18. He was he, washing his feet in the toilet. Yeah. He well, wasn't, he thought he didn't have any body odor because he lived on fruit. Exactly. <laughs> All these stories are in there. Okay. All, everyone. I know, I love them. Okay. Oh hey, my he God. comes back. He's in his robes, um, orange robes. You say, and I can't remember who, who said it in here. People in their 20s aren't themselves yet. No. They haven't become themselves yet. They're still looking. You, know? you talk about Steve Jobs. They, they couldn't get any food in India. <laughs> so they're, they're starving. So Steve, where, where did they... Was it the Atari cafeteria he brought it? No, up? Larry Brilliant was there. He had just... He's like this famous hippie doctor who was there. Um, Another guy who's not well known in but modern should, times, should but better. I'm so glad you interviewed him. Yeah. yeah. He's... Yeah. Anyway, so he was he was eradicating disease in India, and um, somehow Steve got his number because Steve is very good at getting numbers oh. from from important older yeah. gentlemen. And, <laughs> that and sounds they, like another story. They had that. they had uh, lunch at the like um, World Health Organization or Red Cross whatever cafe, and uh, because Steve knew that they had good salad because they they <laughs> actually flew in their salad from Germany, I think it was. It was clean. And, and because it was clean. And Steve was, even then, a vegan, okay? Yep. And um, he was basically starving to death in India because you can't, you really you just... Can't eat meat. He, he, well, he couldn't eat anything because if he ate the vegetables from the street, he, he would sick. get sick. Yeah. And if he ate the meat, he would, yeah. you know, betray his vegan values. Right. So he, he was, was he was pretty skinny. And then somebody else was eating liver the whole time. That was, was that, that, that was uh, Larry. Uh, Larry. <laughs> so yeah. Eat more liver. He yeah. says, I'm not going to eat that. <laughs> it was a great story. And Larry Brilliant. I had never, by the way, so, so many so, of these so, stories I had never heard before. So, and I've heard them all. So Larry Brilliant is the guy who, who went to Stuart Brand and said, "Hey, uh, let's uh, let's start the well, okay?" And then he went to. Um, uh, Steve Jobs and said, hey, I need some money, you know, da, da, da. Steve Jobs was like, you, <laughs> make your own damn money, I'll show you how. Like, let me see your business plan for the well. And in fact, you know, the brilliant, that started his career as an entrepreneur. Nice. You have, there's the quote from Alan Kay, speaking of that. Yeah, read that, please, he, in he, your radio voice. In my radio voice. Alan Kay was uh, the theorist, you say, an intellectual behind the graph of a user interface. But he's also widely considered if you've ever seen him speak you, you'll agree the most brilliant one of the most brilliant thinkers in this whole thing he said business people should be shot <laughs> they always say we're in business to make money and i say well not really you just want to make a few million or billion but the return from xerox park it's about 35 trillion count those extra zeros and tell me what they were really doing they're just trying to be comfortable <laughs> Alan Kay always had a little different way of looking at stuff. Brilliant, brilliant guy. He was. I think he's a Disney Imagineer now. Is that what he's doing now? I can't remember. He's, I think, uh, he's an Apple on. fellow for a while. But the history is he was running Xerox Park and made the Al Alto, which uh, Jobs ripped off to be the Mac. Right. Okay, And then he was the head of Atari Research. Okay, when Atari was the biggest company in the Valley and they basically figured out virtual reality yeah. and music, you know, everything. MIDI and everything, yeah. every everything. multimedia thing. Everything. And then he was at um, Apple in the ATG, the Advanced Technology <sighs> right. Group. I believe he ran it. And yep. so, you know, and it just goes on and on. Yep. I mean, Tron was based on Alan Kay. Really? Yeah, the, the he's the, the Jeff Bridges character. Uh, yeah, I think his name is even Alan. To, <laughs> no he, kidding. Yeah, he's the yeah. dude. He's the. I know. I'm confusing it. <laughs> Nolan Bushnell, of course, interviewed uh, him as well. If you call him the Maverick Manchild who founded Atari, I remember. See, I I had friends who were working at Atari when they were the gods, the kings of the world. There was nobody, and they knew it. They were so arrogant because we're working at Atari. Hey, uh, say no more. I had a friend, his name was Owen, he wrote the uh, the volcano in the back of uh, the, the battle zone game, the oh. tank game. He was very, he said, you see that volcano? I, I wrote that. <laughs> and, graphics. and these guys, there was nobody bigger. There was nobody more powerful. And then 18 months later, boom. Boom. Why? Because uh, a big East Coast company bought it and they thought they had the next Cabbage Patch Kid. <sighs> 
they didn't realize you had to keep Quality. working on yeah. on games and get the new uh, video game the system. Thing. They just thought they could just milk it forever, yeah. and they 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 destroyed it. That's a story that comes up again and again. Yeah. In this business. Right, do you do you uh, having gone through this and and it's kind of I'm sure I mean you also have covered it as as uh, all this time, but it's kind of must have crystallized some thoughts for you about yeah. uh, what it all means. You know, uh, here's what I think it means. Uh, you know, we, everybody, especially everybody like has come in looking at it from the mainstream media, see Silicon Valley as a business story. It's a money pit. It's a money, money pit machine. and a yeah. money machine. And it's true. This is, this has created an incredible amount of wealth incredibly quickly. That's so much not the important story, though. But yeah, that's just a, a part. It's a side effect. It's a side effect of the fact that they won the cultural game. It's the, it's the They created a culture which created their wealth, which attracted the young people looking for the new culture, which made it, you know, made it bigger and then we have generations of really smart young people who are acculturated in this kind of crazy they don't know anything else way. they don't know they anything think that's else. how it is yeah and now that culture is that culture always was a kind of youth subculture right but now it's the the popular culture right the the global youth culture so it goes rock and roll hip-hop geekdom yeah. okay yeah. and that is yeah. you know once once some 20 year old graduating college figures out that you could be a billionaire by the time you're 30 it's unlikely but you could if you go to silicon valley well they all go to silicon they don't valley go to india, india anymore no <laughs> they they're, they're looking for gurus of a different yeah type. so it's like you know it used to be rock stars and bands yeah, now yeah. it's companies and entrepreneurs apps design an app right yeah, or, I i'm not gonna know. be a rock star or a basketball player i'm gonna design an app yeah, and these guys. I don't know if that's all good. I think we. So every everyone I um, interviewed, and I think this is why they wanted to talk to me. These kind of old timers and people are just my age. Right. Um, said in one way or another that they thought that the authentic creative spark that made Silicon Valley yeah. was being smothered by the kind of carpet baggers yeah. and get rich quick, um, you know. But that's the story people. of America. That's what happened to movies. <laughs> that's what happened to TV. Yeah. I was, I, I was a hippie. I remember, you know, Flower Power, and we had the, uh, the Peter Max posters. But then 10 years later, uh, you had flowers on polyester stretch pants at uh, J.C. Penney. It was over. So what's fascinating <laughs> about this is like when did the money take it over and turn the culture in uh, yeah. the wrong direction? Yeah. So if you ask Engelbart about or about what it, does he say? He would say uh, he would say when it happened with the al along. with that apple that 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 Macintosh. <laughs> it's all this. It, shit. it ruined, ruined everything. It. It's all, so funny. Okay. <laughs> Of course. So he that would. in 1984. So if you ask, um, I interviewed Engelbart. He brought the wooden mouse that he used so on beautiful. the mother of all demos. It is primitive, but it's the original mouse, and it's about this big, and it's got big metal buttons on it, and it's like, wow. And he, even and then, this was on the old screensavers. Even then, he was in his 80s. Yeah, you know, he was he was elderly. So that's you know that's the big that's when it begins being the personal computer really yeah, is that moment that's yeah, that yeah. yeah i mean that was you know it was a uh, but i th i think that doug and and i would say steve maybe less so steve but certainly was and a lot of the early guys we were very optimistic that we were going to change the world i do think that yes absolutely and i think one of the great themes and questions of the book is um or arcs really is how did we get from bicycles for the mind? There you go, Steve Jobs' famous analogy. Right, that's what the personal computer was supposed right. to be—a bicycle right. for the mind. To what we've got now, where we're all rats in a social media maze. That's right. That's right. And they can pro, and the owners yes. of these systems can kind of 
prod us and poke Skinner us. Yeah. It's a big, we've, 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 they've created a Skinner box and we've crawled in and it. And we're the rats. And, and we're, we're happy. the rats. And we're and getting those We're happy. And the people who own the system or rent the system can, um, can, can, you know, put inputs, you know, poke us in certain this ways and get we, money out. This, when you talk you know? to Are You Serious... And uh, Jamie Zawinski and Dan Kotke and all of these guys and they is this they didn't think this was what they were up to is is it they were Dan Kotke I mean I'm sorry um, Z Z Zawinski, Z Zawinski was uh, would say it all went to shit in '95 okay he was the the Netscape engineer who was doing the Apple version of the Netscape browser and in 18 months. They became, you know, uh, wealthier than, you know, uh, never had to work again. Okay. What, what, this is the chapter, uh, Jerry the Garcia's last words. Yes. <laughs> and he would say that, uh, like, when that happened, that's, that's when it all, that's when it all went back bad. That's when all the money came in and corrupted <laughs> the beautiful thing. So it's interesting that every generation feels like, the money corrupted their beautiful technological thing. And the question is, is this time, is it really happening? Or in 20 years, are we just gonna be complaining about, you know, the, the, the flying cars that are ruining, ruining the skies <laughs> and not even, not even bother to complain about Facebook or whatever social network we're using. No, and you've got Jim Clark, who's like the accidental billionaire from the Escape IPO building a yacht intentionally with a mast one what is it one foot higher than the tallest <laughs> mast out there but then he can't get it under the golden gate bridge he's amazing <laughs> you know i was talking to him i had a, that was my favorite interview i was talking to him and i'm like and i'm just kind of at the end of the interview and i'm asking him questions like here's an interesting question so jim clark what do you think of jaron lanier oh and then he's like you know i was kind of pissed at him for um uh, virtual reality uh, because I invented virtual oh, reality. Lord. Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. Did he really? But he kind of did. He, he did? So, you know, the GPU that he did yeah. that was the, the heart of the uh, SGI computer. Back when he was at Silicon Graphics. Back, yeah. He founded Silicon Graphics yeah. around a chip, okay? And the chip he made when he was at Park. He's got a point. Because okay? the first virtual reality machine I ever used in 1992 was running on a Silicon Graphics Onyx, probably, but, or something like but that, listen, with that GPU. And that GPU he created when he was at Xerox Park, and he looked oh. at the Alto in that 2D graphical user interface and said, that's that's boring. I like 3D <laughs> graphics. But the only way to get 3D graphics is take the math, which he did for his PhD. Wow. Pro, uh, uh, PhD, he did the 3D math, and he put the math into a chip, and that's the wow. GPU. So he did so invent he it. So he did invent virtual reality, and he did open the internet. So funny. Uh, you know, and, and now Jaron like, Lin Lanier says, you are not a gadget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and guess what? what? What is the AI of our time running on? It's running on GPUs. So he's, he's still re relevant. Great. Isn't that fascinating? So, You're absolutely you know. right. Um, he, Jaron Lanier has turned on VR. He says, my whole field has created crap. And it's like we thrust all of humanity into this endless life of tedium. And it's not how it was supposed to be. He's a little bitter. A little bitter. This is the, uh, this is the anecdote, though, at the end of the uh, Netscape story. And you've got uh, it's Jim Barksdale, Jim Clark, John Doerr. You've got everybody in this. John Giandrea, who is now head of uh, artificial intelligence at Apple. He was a, ma a general magic guy who then went on to Google and now Apple. Um, but at the end, you're talking to Jamie uh, Zawinski and uh, Lou Montulli. It never occurred to me, Lou says, that people could make this much money talking about the Netscape IPO. I probably made 30, 20, 30 million, something like that. But it did seem absurd to me, and in some ways I felt a little numb. This cannot be real. This money cannot actually be there. Jamie Zawinski says, it was just a joke. Actually, my favorite joke from the IPO day. It turns out Jerry, Jerry Garcia, this is nothing to laugh at, but Jerry Garcia died on the day of the Netscape IPO. So the very first joke I heard when I walked in that day was, what were Jerry Garcia's last words? Jerry Garcia. Netscape opened at what? <laughs> That's a. <good. laughs>
<laughs> nice, so there nicely are some played, fictional, sir. There, yeah, nicely some, played. You know, there's. Some, I don't think Jerry actually said that. No, no. And in fact, there's a footnote that, in case you <laughs> wondered whether I interviewed Jerry Garcia on not. the day of his death, I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't but. there. Uh, it's it, it is. Every page for me is full of, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh, I forgot about that. It is so great to see all of this in print. And to tie it all together, to me, I think is the great thing that you've done. I mean, it, there is a narrative. Yeah. There is a thread. There's Waz, this, one of the sweetest, another one of the sweetest guys uh, ever. Truly. Uh, who... Now, I, I was reading with interest to see if Waz... Because remember, Steve Jobs ripped Roz off at Atari for breakout. And uh, Steve got paid a little more than Waz did, but he never told Waz that. Did did, did, did Waz ever that, tell you? That's in there. It's it's in, I know the story's in, in here, yeah. Did, well, did, he, okay, did he say... So yeah, the whole that whole, the story whole story is in there. I was wondering it was if Waz five thousand dollars. Yeah. So, so he Waz found out later when right. Andy Hertzfeld handed him a history <laughs> of Atari, like a quickie history of Atari, and and the numbers were in there. And Waz said that this is, you know, <laughs> obviously you can't trust those journalists. And then he didn't believe it. Turns it. out that he he, the journalist was right. Um, Anyway, but you know, you know they, what was never held it against Steve. It was the well, strangest. Well, well, listen to this one. I said, "Was hey, why don't you tell me about the funeral and the memorial oh. service?" And he said, "I didn't go." Yeah. And I was like, "Wait, were you invited?" He said, "Yeah, but you know, I was busy." Mm. He. Skipped mm. the memorial service, which I think um, it says something. Says something, and he also there's a quote in in there about um, you know Steve Jobs couldn't couldn't design a computer to right. save his life. They all failed. I, yeah. I mean that that is his real point of view, and you know I think he had to wait until Steve Jobs died to be able to say it. And I I think he said it first to me, honestly. I think you're right because. Waz has always been very careful about not saying anything bad yes. about those days. Yes. Uh, be because he really is a sweetheart. He doesn't he, want to be mean. He, yeah, he's organized his whole life around being nice to people yeah. and not disappointing people. He married well because Janet's job is to keep <laughs> people the, from the taking vultures. advantage. Yeah. The vultures. Because yeah. people do take advantage of He has of been taken Steve, advantage of so. over and over. It's yeah. a little sad. Randy Wigginton, Waz, Hertzfeld's in here. The the Apple chapter. Well, actually, it starts with Breakout and then moves on. It's really it's just fun towel designers. Atari's high-strung prima donnas. <laughs> Park opens the kimono. I want let's talk about that when we come back. Do you got Trip Hawkin, Hawkins on in here? Yeah. You've got some you've got Larry Tesler, Bruce Horn. You talked to how many people did you talk to for this? I had over 200 Jeez. interviews. Um, most of them were for many hours. Um, some of them were for a couple days. And I'm uh, two billionaires for several, a couple days that I can... Uh, and why did they talk to you? I think it's really a testament to the openness that's still that that's in the Silicon Valley culture. You know, you can write a very nice letter and explain what you're doing and... and if, you know, and someone will get an email from someone they don't know and say, I like what that kid's doing. That sounds like a cool project. Yes, I will talk to you. That culture is still there. So I think that's that culture is still there. I yeah. think they were uh, realized that I wasn't trying to make a buck, that I was just trying to document something nice. yeah. real and important. You know, they could they, they could also look me up and see the, the stories I'd right. written up to them. Right. Uh, so it's not like I was literally uh you know coming in blind it's it's um a great way to to create a, a timeline uh, for all this yeah and i think you've organized it really well i think the time spent on your knees paid off thank you <laughs> thank you yes yes you thank can you put that in the back of the book yeah, if you want. that will be the uh the, the next blurb <laughs> We're talking to Adam Fisher. The book is Valley of Genius, The Uncensored History of Silicon Valley, as told by the people who lived it.
the hackers, founders, and freaks who made it boom. Uh, available now, bookstores. You, you got an audiobook version of this? Is yes. Is it on Audible? Yes, and I actually read the preface where I talk about, nice. you know, who I am and how I came to nice. this book. But yeah. then we got a, a real professional reader. <laughs> you don't want to listen to me for 20 well, hours. Well, you don't want to sit there because this is probably a pretty long book. That's you know? over 500 pages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it probably, it probably is a 20-hour uh, audiobook. Well worth it. In fact, I'll think I'll get the audiobook just so I can listen. You know, it would be really fun. Did you, did you tape these uh, or did you no write notes? Tapes. Everything is on tape. Or as as they say now, it's it's in a file. <laughs> There's no tape. You know no, that, just, We call it tape. I call wow. it tape. You call it... Did you film this? Your age is <laughs> showing. Filming. We're filming this show for posterity. I MP3'd everything. <laughs> that doesn't sound... It just doesn't sound right. Would you have the ability to to take some of those tapes and, and release them in a, kind of like Michael Cohen and just put it out there? Yeah. I would, I would love to hear an audio book with some of that. Well, you know, on my website, I have five of kind of, kind of my favorite quotes. Oh, oh good. In, in, in the audio. In the audio. You can just push the button on the website and hear. All right. You we'll know. pick one and we'll play it when we come back. How about that? Great. All right. What's the website? Valleyofgenius.com. Okay. And are we... On the I'm going to take a break and then okay. we'll uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll negotiate. Okay, so we'll I, negotiate which quote we should. What do you think? I think you should do the the Biz Stone quote. Biz Stone. Yeah, because founder of Twitter. Yeah. All right, coming up. But first, a word. We got to make some money. I know all you hippies don't like money, but hey, somebody's got to keep the lights on around here. I should. <laughs> Actually, I always try to pick sponsors. Uh, that help you, right, uh, that we use and that we can tell you about that'll make a difference in your life. And this is a great one. Uh, Quicken Loans, biggest and best lender in the country, realizes that there's something happening right now to home buyers that's really upping their anxiety. You know, buying a house is like the most expensive thing, the biggest check you'll ever write. And it's a big deal because this is where you're going to live for years, right? You don't want to be rushed. You don't want to be pressured. And yet, interest rates are starting to ratchet up, aren't they? That means as you're out there house hunting, the anxiety that this house is going to cost you more if you take another month or two is going to cost you more and more and more as time goes by. Quicken Loans has a solution. Of course, it's Rocket Mortgage. We've talked about Rocket Mortgage before. They, they call it the power buying process. Here is how it works. Quicken Loans will verify income, assets, and credit. And they'll do it in less than 24 hours. And as we've always said with Rocket Mortgage, it's no, no work on your part. They have trusted relationships with all the financial institutions. You don't have to go to the attic and find papers. You don't have to fax them anything. You, they will do it all for you within 24 hours. Now, once you get verified approval, you have the strength of a cash buyer. In fact, when you're buying a house and you say, I'm approved, I'm good for the loan, the seller loves you because they don't have to, there's no contingencies. There's no, well, if I get the loan, I'll buy. No, you're good for it. But that's when the really interesting thing happens because once you're verified, you qualify for the all-new exclusive rate shield approval they lock your rate in for up to 90 days so you now have three months to shop and you don't have to ever worry about rates going up your rate is locked actually if rates go down your rate will go down so you win either way it's exactly what you'd expect from america's best mortgage lender rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation get there today before you start house hunting get all your ducks in a row and then you can really enjoy the process of finding your next home. Rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Rate shield approval. Now I got the lawyer stuff. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year pur purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states. And MLS Consumer Access org number 3030. Here's what you need to remember. Rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. We thank them for supporting triangulation and thank you for supporting them. Rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Adam Fisher is my guest. He uh, He's an editor at uh, Wired Magazine, right? You're a staff. Well, I was. Oh, and, not anymore. But huh? I'm going to be, uh, it looks like I'm going to be a contributing editor okay. pretty soon because they want me That back. means you're, you're even better. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> MIT Technology Review, New York Times Sunday Magazine, travel writer. <laughs> It was a good gig while it lasted. Well, you know, don't turn those free vacations down Never. when the New York Times sends you. No, I would take them yeah. in a heartbeat. Uh, but right now, uh, after three years, he's been working on this interview. Four? Five? Four? It's going on five. But Jeez Louise. It's a 
But this is a major work here. I had to sell my house to get this done. Really? Yes. This is a labor of love. Holy cow. And this was, I literally locked myself in a room. No vacations. Like, this is pretty much the first time I'm out. That's why I'm so <laughs> hyper. I get to talk to someone. <laughs> People! Well, thank your family in that case. Oh, my for God. I can't believe I'm still married, but <laughs> she's a saint. Thank you, Carrie. Put, putting up, oh, you know, I forgot. I mentioned Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish. You put that right at the beginning there, and you quote both Steve, uh, yeah. Stuart Brand and Steve Jobs. Yeah, that's the whole book right there. Stay, stay hungry, hungry, stay, stay foolish. foolish. Steve Jobs quoting Stuart Brand. That's like, if you had to do the book in five words, there it is. So, is, is you say Biz Stone, we're going to play a little quote from, this is from Adam's uh, website, part of his interview with one of the founders of Twitter. Listen. Only in Silicon Valley can you be like, yeah, we would like $10 million, and... We'll sell you a percentage of our theoretical company <laughs> that will, may one day have lots of profits. And if we lose all of the money, we don't have to give it back to you. Um, and maybe we'll start something else. Of course. In what crazy world does something like that exist? Like, wait, you can just blow the money and then you don't know what back? Just wash your hands clean, done. Sorry about that. Sorry, spent all your money. Oh, well. I mean, it's just crazy. And not only that, here's here's another scenario. Here's what some people do. They say, we need $25 million, but, you know, just so we can stay focused, my co-founder and I each need $3 million of that money and, and in our bank accounts so that we don't have to, you know, worry about bills and that we can really focus, okay? And then they blow the money that, and they say, oh, well, that didn't work out, but we're still keeping the $3 million each, so now we're rich. What the hell? <laughs> that is crazy. That So... It's a crazy world. This is like some kind of nut place place where you can do that kind of stuff. I can't believe he admitted that. What do you get these people high before you interview them? <laughs> I can't reveal my <laughs> methods, Leo. I cannot reveal my methods. Holy cow, I can't. Although his partner, Evan Williams, very famously gave back the money on audio to the investors. He didn't have to. And those investors are mad that they don't have a piece of Twitter. Yeah! They think it was a big conspiracy. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So you win either way, kids. Do you think kids will read this and see this as a roadmap, a manual for uh, getting rich? I hope not. No, I mean I I I wrote it for the kids who didn't who are you know making the same old mistakes. You know yes. Zuckerberg has ma made the same mistakes that Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly made um, to some extent. Uh, you can see these echoes, these historical echoes, um, and I think what what the kids need is f uh, to understand where they come from first of all, and understand that all the people who built the stuff before them were also kids, not so different, and to yeah. understand that hey, you know, maybe they can do it a little better this time because yeah. they are going to do it again. The kids are coming; they got the they got the tools, and they're going to make something that's going to you know blow up the the established order again. But let's like maybe do it better this time. Not make those same mistakes. Yeah. Who surprised you that you interviewed? Was there, was there anybody you thought, oh, this is going to be boring and turned out not to be? Or somebody who turned out to be evil you thought was going to be nice? Any surprises? Oh, my God. It was pretty much a surprise every day. <laughs> really. Surprised I, that they'd even talk to you. I and was just... How candid was Bill Biz Stone? That's amazing. I know. That's what I'm saying. This openness. Yeah. Okay. And then well, there was, I was also saying, you know, everybody, when they turn about 40, they decide that the money has ruined everything. Right? So there's the guy who... Ha his name is on the Twitter patent, okay? Is a billionaire because of Twitter and the other investments he made. Um, saying like, oh... Yeah, after after moi the deluge, yeah. you know. So that <laughs> that's my French. Pardon my French, but you, but know. you know the first guy said that Louis the Fourteenth. You know what happened to him. So um, that looks like Twit. Looks a little bit like Twitter, doesn't it? Wasn't going to say anything, Leo. Yeah. So who do you think copied whom? I don't know. Is this going to be in? Uh, this is the, in my book. The, the, what, interview yeah, me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Because because uh, before Twitter, as as we were talking, uh, uh, Ev had a thing called Odeo, which is a podcast network, and I was one of the most popular podcasts on there. Mm -hmm. So I know Ev was very well aware of Twit. I actually asked him because then they founded Twitter, and I said, Ev, didn't you think that um, maybe that would 
confuse people with Twit? He said, Leo, I didn't think either of us were going anywhere, so I didn't think it was going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, Ev came out to be one of kind of the heroes of the book. I think. His, you think? Yeah, you enjoyed talking to him? I enjoyed talking to him. You know, he was, uh, and he, you know, he's like this zealot character. Right? You know, he creates this new yes. kind of printing press called Blogger. Right. Then he shows, and then it gets, uh, so that's important. Like, he Absolutely. created the modern yeah. printing press, right? It's called yes. Blogger. And then... He it get, he gets sucked up into Google, right? Uh, so he's there to see the IPO, right? Yeah, and yeah. then shot shot out the other side. He <laughs> tries the podcasting. Is too yeah. early. Yeah. Turns it into Twitter. Yep. That's a show, yeah. right? Yeah. And now what is he? He's doing. He's doing Medium. Okay. Which so, is great. Which is great. And this let's is just another printing press. It's another printing press. And we're talking about the kids learning, right? Well, let's compare Twitter to uh, Medium. So Medium is long form, Twitter is short form. Right. Medium is um, subscription based, not advertising based, right? Medium doesn't have a like a, a heart or no heart like Twitter does, you, like the thumbs up, right? It has like a, an analog, how many claps? Now it has applause. How many claps? Yeah. So he has, he realizes that the way you set up the system changes yeah. the the kind of conversations yeah. that you are are can have he, knows he that realized yeah. that that the medium is, is the, message. the message okay yeah. and he is trying to iterate yeah. and fix things yeah. and i and he's not you know he's he's not telling the world about this like you just have to watch and discover it yeah. um and, and so i think he really is you know, trying to make the world a better place, uh, you know? And, and, and I think we can, we can see little glimmers of hope, um, you know, if we look at this history and, you know, right, right now there's a lot of people with their pitchforks out coming after Silicon Valley, a lot of journalists who literally think everybody is evil right. and everybody is corrupt. Right. It's funny because five years ago when I started this book, it was just the opposite, okay? Right. We could do no wrong. You know, there's this- It's cyclical. It's cyclical. It's just yeah. like a reputational collapse. But, you know, what I'm really interested in is creating, you know, not looking back and being nostalgic. I'm interested in creating a history that we can use to go forward. Right, a narrative that really will show us, you know, you know how to get to a better place in the future, and I think that's what this is. It's like a manual, you know. Another famous quote: "The only way to navigate the future is to look in the rearview mirror." Right? <laughs> this is the rearview mirror. <laughs> and and the other quote, which I I want to say, Alan Kay, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. That is Alan Kay all the way. Yep. The Valley of Genius, the uncensored history of Silicon Valley. It, you know, you won't be able to put it down. So prepare, you know, get some snacks, uh, get comfortable, because it is really the story of what an amazing era, maybe one of the most inventive, exciting eras in human history. And we just are living through it now. Yeah. Thank you for recording it. Thank you for getting the voices in here that you did. And to hear them in there, there's no... Adam Fisher in this. This is their voices, and hear their voices talking about this is dramatic. It's really fascinating. I'm I'm so glad you wrote this. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. reading it and getting yeah. it and yeah. having me on. I was there. Yeah. But I don't remember any of it because I was stoned. Uh, we do try. <laughs> no, that was earlier. We do triangulation every. I don't know why I said that. Every Friday, 3 p.m. Civic, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. If you want to uh, watch the show live, you can uh, go to twit.tv slash live. You can even be in a studio audience if you'd like. Just email tickets at twit.tv if you're going to be in Northern California. But, of course, everything we do really is intended for uh, on-demand delivery to fit your busy day. So just go to twit.tv slash TRI. You can download every episode, uh, audio or video. We do video as well. Uh, you can also subscribe in your favorite podcast program. You'll find Triangulation right there. And if you subscribe, that way you get it the minute it's available, hot off the presses. Uh, you can also use your special smart assistant, that thing you talk to, that little air freshener you talk to, whether it's from Google or Amazon or uh, Apple or Harman Kardon, and uh, just say, listen to Triangulation. You'll get the most recent episode. 
Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.